Hello and welcome to a new episode of The World Beyond the Ice Walls. This is the seventh episode of this series, and in case you're confused, have you never seen one of these episodes uh, before? Well, here's the gist of it. So, the world is like this. It's not only what we see when we are in our world ourselves, then there's four gates that divide the known lands through and between the rest of the planet. The rest of the planet includes the lands beyond the ice walls. The ice walls are Antarctica, of course. There's four gates, called the Tiger's Gate, then the Serpent's Gate, then the Leviathan's Gate, and finally, the Sentinel's Gate. We've covered all of these and how the European powers and many other powers of Earth explore the lands beyond the ice walls, made it difficult for others to traverse, or made it easier for people to settle in them, and encounter the people that already lived in them, or the creatures that already blessed the land with their presence. We have done a lot in this series, we have discovered a lot of information. We started up here, in the Serpent's Gate, from these areas here, we moved ourselves into Xenonesia and Dishiposu, we've covered the lands of Aten, Kaipuke, Pairiri, Motoputua, we covered the Tiger's Gate, we've covered the continent of Thoth, Antilia, we've covered the ideals of the world with Holvenism, we've covered the Mins and Nevis Islands, we've covered the Avalons and Camelot, and even Merlin, we've covered Hibremasog, Arfornia, We've covered the Islands of the Blast. We've covered even more. We've covered even the Leviathan Skate, Pitesha. We've covered Patiti, Ketumati. We even covered all these lands right here. And now it's time to cover Zerzura and Shangri-La. Let's start by Zerzura. As we have already covered the land beyond the Leviathan Skate, we will not be recollecting the facts that are explained in the videos before it. If you want to know more about the story of the world, then I recommend watching the videos, in order, possibly, from the links down below in the description. So let's get right into it and see what Zerzura, God's hallucination, is already about. This tropical continent is similar in size to Europe, yet far more climatically diverse. From misty temperate woodlands to dusty inland deserts, lush lowland swamps and towering mountain ranges, its scenic vistas would be breathtaking to anyone with a clear view, but rarely are they perceived with a sober mind. This land is drenched in naturally occurring hallucinogenics, carried in the pollen that fills the air. The microbes in its lakes and rivers, and the flesh and fluids of its fauna, Zerzura has a variety of mechanisms to alter the mental state of anyone who treads upon these lands. For its inhabitants, the line between the real and unreal is constantly blurred. Most outsiders would say that the world of a Zerzuran cannot be trusted, but the locals have come to find that while their view of the physical world may be distorted, it is only because they can see everything otherwise invisible to the human eye. So here is the flag of Zerzura. So Zerzura itself is a continent, but it's actually owned by a single country, the Zerzurai, a Neo-Prussian Empire, Aka Zerzura. The successor to the Prussian Empire, one of the first pioneers in the second circle alongside the Spanish, Venetians and Ottomans. While its contemporaries would fall into internal conflict in the upheavals of the Napoleonic Age and lose most of their outer world territories, the Prussians would re-establish themselves as the great first power of the Atlas. After their homeland fell to the French domination, as you can see right here, uh, Prussia is part of the French sphere of influence in Europe, as Napoleon won the uh, Napoleonic Wars, and so his son rules Europe, this is Napoleon II, so Zerzura is under uh, the influence of the old Prussians, but the Prussians have uh, come to the second ring. So, the Prussian royalty led a mass exodus to the continent of Zerzura, making it the new seat of power for the colonial empire. The abundance of mind-altering substances they are constantly exposed to have not been a hindrance to their development. They have long since adapted to it seeing through illusions and hysteria, and taking advantage of their altered states to gain a greater understanding of the true nature of this world, its past and what lies beyond. 
So here we have different settlements in the lands of the Rizura. We have the Zarim settlements right here in the bottom. We have Hayapul Peresti settlements right here in the north center. Then we have the Fsurta settlements right here in the southeast. Finally, we have an example of the things and people that live in Zerzura. As you can see, there's different species even. Not only there's uh, humans, of course, but there are Zerzeroblemium, as we saw in the first episode. There's a part of the world beyond the ice walls where people without heads live. These are the Blemie of old Roman myths uh, who were identified with those that lived in the Blemie area of, uh, of um, Sudan nowadays, or Egypt. And here they are, even in Zerzura, under the shadow of the Great Fungo. Then we have the Persians, the Turks, Assyrians, and even the Jews. They all live peacefully under the Zerzuran Eagle. Even have some beasts that come from the continent of Shangri-La, which will be the next in the subjects of this video. An assortment of Zerzura's major ethnic groups, posed next to some of the continent's native fungi and fauna. Originally, the Ottoman Turks and Assyrians had started to colonize parts of the continent before the collapse of their empire and Prussian exodus, resulting in the entire landmass falling under a single regime. The Prussian people have a uniquely strong brotherhood with the Blemie in Zinonesia, so much so that a good number of the Blemie have relocated here to live as proud Zerzuran citizens. The Gewir beast is a hoofed herbivore commonly found around the steppe and desert regions, so it's the Gewir beast. They are known to spew hallucinogenic mucus out of their nose when threatened. So. Zerzura doesn't only own their own major island, it does in fact have somewhat of a colonial empire, since it is, technically, the heirs of the Prussian colonial empire. So right here, in the Leviathan Gate, the only part we didn't mention in the last episode was the colony that Zerzura has in the southernmost part of the northern part of the Leviathan Gate, which is Todes Griffreich. Todes Griffreich is a colony of Zerzura. It's Zerzura's most vital link to trade with the known world, which is the known world be, um, behind the ice walls. They use cannonballs filled with hallucinogenic fungi to terrorize French ships and subdue Leviathans by sending them into a trance, a state of trance, where they cannot understand what is really going on since they are being affected by the hallucinogenic mucus. Then here we have New Nestoria, the Shaded Isles. Almost the entirety of their surfaces are covered by a thick forest of trees similar to the Darkaena Cinnabari of Socotra, with branches so tightly packed that very little light or water reaches the forest floor below. The canopy is so dense, in fact, that one could walk or even build houses on top of them with little fear of the branches giving out. The vast stretches of shaded land beneath the streetscapes have a tranquil yet foreboding aura to them. Be wary of predators that lurk beneath the branches. So it's an incorporated part of uh, an incorporated territory of Zerzura, New Nestoria. As you can see, there's a small line traced from Zerzura to New Nestoria. So as you can see, they do have some territories outside of the Second Ring, but they do have some connection with the lands inside of the known world. Of course, Prussia, their homeland, but even as we can see, one of their archipelagos, New Nestoria, has the same kind of trees that exist in Socotra. In case you didn't know, Socotra is this island right here off the coast of Somalia and Oman. Which is pretty interesting, if I say so myself. Then it's time to cover one of the most interesting and confusing parts of the entire world beyond the ice walls. This is Shangri-La, one of the only places where humans are not the major species. They are not the ones in control. Instead, the Shangri-La is not inhabited only by humans and our similar populations, but it is in fact inhabited by the Vogelvolk of Shangri-La. First, we will check the Shangri-La Garden of the Vogelvolk paragraph right here, and then we will discover the actual Vogelvolk that live in Shangri-La. By the way, Shangri-La was believed to be one of the places beneath the known world by the people of Tibet. 
As you can see in the last video, we discovered that the Golok Empire, a Tibetan empire that raised up in the 18th century, was created through the help of the people and the creatures that live in Shangri-La. So it's not a surprise that the people and the creatures that live in Shangri-La are so relevant to the world. So it's time to get right into it. Shangri-La, Garden of the Vogelwald. There is a paradise hidden deep within the mountain ring. Past over 1,000 kilometers of mountainous wasteland, there lies an incredible network of gigantic glacial lakes and fertile valleys among the daunting peaks. This great refuge of fertility has existed for eons, preserving a unique and ancient assortment of wildlife, and sustaining the oldest civilization in the Second Ring. With a 6 million year history, not one, but five sapient races of Ornithischian dinosaurs, first encountered by the Prussians and gaining from them the collective term Vogelvolk in reference to their beaked and feathered appearance. Though intelligent and capable, a lack of suitable plants has prevented the invention of agriculture here and creation of agriculture societies like those of the known world, resulting in a drastically reduced pace of technological development which had yet to surpass that of mankind's Iron Age by the time the first humans explorers arrived. However, the Vogel have been able to establish very complex societies. Since the first Vogel hunter-gatherers, they have diverged into five species, four of which have adapted to incredibly different economic niches, allowing trade networks most complicated and most profitable to, to be strung up between them. The major cities are all at the confluences of the four groups as they trade with another. They have gone through their periods of prosperity and calamity, but now, just as the human's contact is beginning, they find themselves in a golden age as the trade flows with great vitality and the societies are powerful. So basically, the people inside of Shangri-La, the people not close to the borders, close to the colonies, well, these areas are inhabited by sapient dinosaurs. So if there's a scientific theory or at least a hypothesis, that eventually if dinosaurs were allowed to remain alive and not go extinct for the mass eruptions and uh, uh, asteroids that hit Earth, then it was believed that eventually some kind of dinosaurs would achieve some kind of sapience, some kind of intelligence. Already there was a Troodon, which was a type of dinosaur that could actually kind of it, I mean, it wasn't especially intelligent, but it was most intelligent of all the other dinosaurs. So, this brings it to their logical conclusion, as since these dinosaurs were not hit by the problems that were within the known world, and the asteroid that hit Earth did not cause extinction outside of the second ring, then the Chobans, the Mizraks, the Balikis, the Myras, the Buzavikis, were not conflicted by the asteroid and their death, and their deathly apocalypse. Therefore, eventually, the history of the Vogavolk was created. So let's get right into the actual Vogavolk themselves. Vogel being beak in Prussian, I believe, in German of course that is. The Vogelvolk of Shangri-La. The history of the Vogelvolk begins with a lineage of Pachycephalosaurian dinosaurs, which first attained the spark of sapiens over 6 million years ago. These original Vogelvolk lived a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, used tools, spoke languages, explored beyond their homeland and conquered a wide array of environments, just as the earliest Homo sapiens did in more recent history. Yet, despite their intelligence and the vast amount of time they had to develop, the Vogel had not surpassed humans in their technological advancements. Instead, their societies developed far more gradually, and in a far different way. Agriculture is the key differentiating the factor between the courses of human and Vogelvolk civilization. Mastery of food production is the foundation on which advanced societies are built, but with no farmable crops to be found in the valleys of Shangri-La, the Vogelvolk could only sustain themselves as generalized nomadic hunter-gatherers. While Shangri-La would not provide the Vogelwolf with the same opportunities that Earth had granted the early man, it would, it would still prove to be the key to their future development. 
The abundance of plant and animal life in the lakeside valleys was so great that the Vogelvolk rarely found themselves in conflict for food, and the mountains between them discouraged the invasion from one valley to another. Instead, the Vogel were more likely to trade with them than plunder their neighbors. This trading proved to be prosperous enough to where the early Vogel tribes would not have to constantly move to attain the resources they needed, instead they would claim territories where they would live in a semi-permanent settlement. With this trade sustaining them, some tribes were encouraged to branch out and establish new territories, where they would specialize in collecting resources that couldn't be found in the fertile valleys. These territories would come to define the economic niches and means of survivals for the tribes living in them. Some tribes settled along the coasts of lakes and thusly specialized in fishing, others remained further inland and managed the forests. Some lived around the entrances to the extensive cave system beneath Shangri-La, where they collected stones for tool making, harvesting fungi, and hunted troglodytes. I mean, sorry, troglodyte creatures, not troglodytes. And others lived further out into the desolate mountains, where they followed and hunted herds of grazing animals. Over the course of millions of years, these divisions in territory and lifestyle would cause the Vogel to diverse genetically and physiologically. Intermingling between those of different lifestyles would occur less and less frequently, with each group further specializing for their roles in their greater Vogel trade network, leading to higher productivity and thus more advanced societies as time progressed. This resulted in the emergence of five distinct species, all of which rely on each other to sustain their civilizations. Basically, while humanity started diversifying their lifestyles after harnessing fruit production, the Vogels diversified first and slowly built up an abundance of resources great enough to lift each other of each of their societies to new heights. As remarkable and complex as their arrangement is, it has a clear weakness that being the careful balance with which must be maintained between them. As different as the five species have become, their ability to still communicate and cooperate as much as they seek, to gain the upper hand on their rivals both within and between the species. So they are power hungry, but not as much as we are. Or I guess they are no less competitive and power hungry as we are, than we are. If these conflicts are pushed too far, trade networks will break down. When trade stops flowing, societies suffer and starve, their desperation leading to further conflict. This can easily spiral out of control, leading to the total societal collapse across large swaths of Shangri-La. This has happened on various occasions, each time knocking their development back by centuries, and is another explanation for why the development of vulnerable societies has been so gradual over the eons. Despite this, the society still continues to make new advancements through each uh, successive collapse, becoming more resilient as time goes on. Now, the Vogelvolk face the greatest turning point in their history as the new race comes into the picture, that being human. Man will they maintain the balance with the addition of humanity, leading to greater prosperity for all, or will their system crumble under the added weight and collapsing for the first final time and pave the way for something entirely new? So that was definitely a mouthful. That was the entirety of the lore for the Vogel Walk of Shangri-La. So first we have the Chobans, the Nomads of the Mountains. The Chobans inhabit the mountains Nose Highlands surrounding Shangri-La. Descendant from the archaic herd-hunting nomads, they've, yet, they've taken on a pastoralist lifestyle, still nomadic but now sephardic, sephardic? Sephardic? I'm not really sure what that means. Domesticated breeds of nodosaurid and leptoceratopsid grazers, through they do, though they do enjoy a good hunting from time to time. So these are basically the kind of... Uh, nomads of the mountains i resemble like the lifestyle that the people in central asia had i'm going to assume then we have the mizrax of the uh, also called the gardeners of the valleys the mizrax are descendant from early vogel tribes that never left the fertile lakeside valleys and continued their ancestor hunter gatherer lifestyle v through millions of years of sustainable forestry they have gradually molded their ecosystem to maximize the production of food and descendant from early vogels well I'm just gonna be skimming around this because I don't really want to like see everything. You can pause and read for yourselves. This is very uh, fantasious, I guess. I, I, 
Of course, when you call it in the, in the context of the lands beyond the ice walls, I am very doubtful of the existence of creatures like these. I can, I can bear with the existence of dinosaurs since they could have just not gone extinct, but these seems a bit too developed, don't you think? That said, it is still very interesting. So the uh, Balik cheese seem to be some people that ride around, uh, basically live around the coasts, and they can broadly be divided between those living on the mainland coast, almost always under the rule of settled Mizrak societies, so they tend to be inferior and uh, subjected to the Mizrax, or in some cases they are uh, they organize themselves in a variety of ways and set on different, different kind of societies. Then we have the Mayara, the explorers of the caves, descending from those early Vogels who settled around the mouths of caves and ventured into them to collect resources. The Mayara now live almost entirely underground. While the caves and tunnels beneath the mountains of Shangri-La are vast, they only held so much wealth. Over time, the Mayara were forced to go deeper and deeper into the caves in search of valuable metals when everything- Certainly not, not original, I mean, it's pretty original, that's for sure. Then we have the Howa Howa Tua Federation, which is right here in the borders of the Kawigawubu Kampar. It's bound to lakeside lowland valleys, the ability of city-states of Mizrak and Balik Vogel to exert control over their noble Choban have always been limited, only achievable when a large number of cities manage to unify and economically coerce the mountain nomads into doing their bidding. This federation has emerged not through conquest but as a response to it, as the smaller Choban tribes of the region find themselves doubly incentivized to cooperate with lowlanders in order to resist the daunting forces of the Kawigawuk Empire. Man. Then we have the elder tribes of the Buzavchis. The small primitive tribes living as our hunter-gatherers on the icy edges of southern Shangri-La may have seemed irrelevant compared to the advanced multiracial societies in more fertile lands, in truth they are of the root of Gogabok civilization. Maintaining the same lifestyle for millions of years in isolation, their oral traditions contain the most complete of history of Vogel civilization, stretching back to time before the five races even diverged. Hmm, then we have the Aglopolgekia. Oh my. Aglopolgekia, where even is that? It's number seven. I, I ain't seeing no seven. I ain't seeing no seven, lads. So I will ignore this because I am not even seeing where it is. Huh. Weird. Maybe I'm blind. Tell me in the comments if I'm. Oh, it, right. There you go. That was pretty hard to see. You cannot. Uh, come on, man. Come on. It was pretty hard to see. We have the Aglopolgkia. Originally one of the plucked kingdoms, the local Balikchi have absorbed the old order of the god kings and now believe themselves to be truly divine beings separate from the rest of the Vogel kind, including the Balikchi still subjugated by the plucked kingdoms, who they took look, up, look upon with disdain. So what are the plucked kingdoms? Well, it's right here. The plucked kingdoms, which by the way are just literally on the borders of the um, Aglopolkia, Long ago, during the period of great instability, the balance between the four pillars of Vogel civilization was so upset that each race was brought into near complete ruin. Only the eternally stable Buzavchis of the far south could impose an order that would restore the balance. And so they did, establishing a series of empires that would only, uh, but would once again unite the Vogel and put their history back on track. The plucked kingdoms are the last remnants of them. After thousands of years of rule and being so distant from other Butzavchis, the descendants of those long forgotten conquerors are seen as gods by their Balikchi and Mizrak subjects, who spare them no luxury, particularly in the effort to keep them cool in this climate far too hot for them, hence the feather bucking from which their name is derived. That is, that is, that is very great world building. Even if this is not as believable as basically anything we've read, honestly, this is probably the craziest part yet. Uh, I, I really love how much work was put into this by the creator of the map. Then we have the Akrasog Empire, the most powerful remaining transoceanic Choban Empire, controlling both the more advanced settled societies of the lakeside as well as supporting the recent settlements of Misrak along the marine coast, all while remaining independent from human hegemony. For now, at least they are in control, and largely dictate the terms of trade and diplomacy with nearby colonial powers, especially when considering that they are not the and they are the humans' main line of defense against marauding nomadic hordes situated further west. 
uh, through a happenst happenstance of all the human societies the interface would happen to be Islamic, which gives the impression that Islam is just a not thing humans do rather than a standalone religion, much to the dismay of local missionaries. The, lo the coastal Mizrak have taken some interest in the faith though, so we have some Muslim, Muslim dinosaurs. Is that blasphemous to Muslims? I'm not sure. I'm not. I didn't make this map, guys. For real. Just don't don't blame me. In case, just don't 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 do it. Don't blame me. So we have seen the vocal kind. I think we've seen all the vocal kind. I'm pretty sure we have some Marlock tributaries here. Uh, not really sure what that is. Probably something uh, also vocal kind related. But we have seen most of what the vocal kind are about. So Shangri-La, the land of the vocal kind. We have seen most of it. But now is the most interesting part for me, the fact that some of these civilizations are in contact with humans. And so where are the contacts with humans? Well, on the coast of the land beyond the second ring. Yep, of course, this is the land beyond the second ring. So the second ring is here, and this is literally the land beyond the second ring. So let's start with the first group of humans to settle this land. We have Egypt. So Egypt already has a lot of colonies. We've seen some colonies here in the continent of Petitia, and we have seen some colonies in other continents, outside of the ice walls, all right? So Egypt owns a little stretch of land, which is called Sarawat Gorida. When the Ottomans fell, the territory fell into Egyptian hands. They were very persistent in their offer to incorporate Gezan Galgar, which is this one. But now that the Egyptians no longer see the value in this colony, among all the impoverished settlers that have realized their government is withdrawing, the idea of incorporation has appeared, but with a very different dynamic. Maybe so incorporating Gezlan Gaglar into Sarawat Kodida or the opposite, I'm not really sure. So Gezlan Gaglar seems to be independent. Unlike their Spanish counterparts, the citizens of abandoned Ottoman colonies managed to survive and defend themselves against Choban raids. Gezian Gaglar is the most integrated of all human vogel societies. The native Turks and Misrak live and work on equal terms with each other in peace and isolation from the rapidly changing world around them. So here is the first example we see of actually humans and whatever these things are. I mean, okay, okay, we know what these are, Vogelvolk. So the first example of Vogelvolk and humans living an hour, I mean, uh, just next to each other and not killing each other. So that's cool. Or, you know, it's interesting to say the least. And we have an Omani colony. Once again, Oman is a place that has a bunch of colonies all around the world. Here we can have see uh, major colonies we have in Petitia, one another one is here. They even here have one of the biggest uh, important colonies in the lands of the Leviathan Gate, and so on and so forth. So here is the colony of Kum al Silamia. Stumbled into tricking the Ark Sarug into thinking they are a small population of traders without a homeland and would hate to break the illusion. Interesting. Then we have some just description of the people here. Bialarinus people, descendants of Spanish colonists who were ransacked and kidnapped by a Choban Vogel horde, taken to the inner valleys of Shangri-La and sold as, pe as pets or slaves to wealthy Mizraks. As the generations passed, the Spaniards evolved into an endemic ethnic group that can be found in most major cities, almost exclusively working as performers, dancing, juggling, singing, clowning, etc amusing and fascinating the Vogel with their alien behaviors and anatomy. They speak a rudimentary version of local Vogel languages and a Spanish-based Creole. This is horrifying, and I hate it. Humans being sold into slavery to non-human species is probably one of the worst tropes in anything. I just, I just don't like it. It's fine as, as long as we do it, all right? It's fine as long as we have like little aliens being owned by humans. I mean, it's still, sure, it's still a, a non-moral, but it's acceptable. But when it's the dinosaurs owning humans, I, I just don't like it. It's too weird. Then we have the Colinas de Encontro. Here is a Portuguese colony. We have seen also a lot of Portuguese colonies around the world. There's like a bunch of them. But uh, we have really not traced any lines, which is pretty weird since we usually do trace lines to connect the colonies to their colonizers. So we will do right just that in this case, even if we have not done these before. Luckily, the Portuguese have a bunch of territories around the world, and that means that connecting these to the actual uh, territories that we have around the known world won't be so hard since we can pass right from Timor-Leste, which is East Timor, 
to the lands beyond the assault. Oh, that is a bad line and I'm going to have to do redo it. Okay, right there, that's better. Let's just go around the Leviathan, maybe right here. And then we can go right there. We can even take this land. And also just go right here, since we have to collect the lands of Pitesha too. And then take this route and go right there. Sorry for the patience you had to have to just bear with that. Anyways, the Colinas the Encontro, still trying to court local Choban into helping them trade across the mountains to the lakes, hesitant to involve themselves in human affairs after observing the conflicts provoked by the French and Prussians, the Choban must, would rather chase the humans away and retake control of the coastal misery tribes under Portuguese rule, styling themselves as liberators. So the Chobans are against the Portuguese, I believe. Here we have the Vogel's Festung, which is in the Zerzuran sphere of influence, so another one of these Zerzuran colonies, and also like direct colonies. So we can see there's a division, like these bluer parts and lighter blue parts are probably part of the Zerzuran colony itself, while the rest might just be part of their sphere of influence. The Prussians initially only possessed a few poor cities, which are these probably, uh, through which they traded with the local Mizrak and their overlords, and the nomadic Choban, uh, Choban Der Derku Empire. Where is the Derku Empire? I have, I have yet to see what the Ch Derku Empire is. Who connected them with far more wealthy lakeside markets across the mountains. After the French arrived and successfully destabilized the Derku, the Prussians assumed direct control of their nomads and the coastal Vogel, establishing many military bases and outposts deep into the mountains to solidify Derku control and shut down any means of to overland trade between the French and the Vogel of the lakes. So, once again, the French have to do with this. Uh, the French meddling with affairs of anyone is just like a repetitive thing at this point. Uh, the French, since they won the Napoleonic Wars, have basically been part of the meddling and anything. We have yet to stop meddling and it appears that I have found another uh, just victim of their meddling. Now they even meddle with the dinosaurs. I mean, once again, pretty original, that's for sure. Uh, so this is where we can trace their colonial holdouts, as well as this island right here, which we will get to later called Henrietta. But first, let's just check the Nid Libre. Anyways, French colonies and sphere of influence. Ever since the French ship arrived, shipped. Alright, ever since the French ships arrived at the coast of Outer Shangri-La, the land of the Vogel has been the primary stage of Franco-Prussian competition. The Prussians had already developed a firm alliance with a powerful nomadic Vogel empire, which traversed the mountains and reigned over the city-states on the other side. With Prussian support, the nomads expanded their territory through conquests, threatening the most prosperous of the marine societies, the Empire of Aroi. With the Prussians looking at the other way, the Aroi had no choice but to rely on the French to support them in the Defending against the invaders. The Aroi and several other societies would come to rely on the French for defense, trade, administration, and basic survival. The French making the most of their limited range of influence by investing heavily in the development of these coastal cities. They haven't given up breaking into lakeside markets yet, however, as they closely co cooperate with a subterranean Mayara kingdom, which may be their key to expanding their power to the region. So, once again, let's check back. The Mayara were these guys, the explorers of the caves, which are smaller and more agile than the other um, Vogelwalk. And the show oh, by the way, these are Chauvins, so let's just remember. So these guys are in control of that, and these guys are in control of this. Yeah, it's harder than it seems to remember all these people. Then we have a uh, um, Scandinavian colony. I mean, I'm not gonna trace a line. It's so small. It's just some port cities. A series of port cities that enrich themselves for trade with Mizrak tribes. The local Mizrak have taken advantages of, uh, of this trade to develop their lands and use gunpowder to fend off their former, former Choban overlords. Interesting. Then we have a Korean, Korean colony. This is so rare. Co I really, the other time Koreans had a colony was like here. I still remember it, it was so rare, the Korean Neferbasta. It was in episode 1 that I covered it. I don't think we saw an- oh, and also this land too. I don't even remember a single other Korean colony in the entirety of the known world or the world beyond the S walls. So that is absolutely crazy. We will be tracing a line 
from Korea to their colonies beyond the ice walls, since at this point it's not anymore just a random thing that happens, but apparently they do have somewhat of a colonial empire, which is honestly quite crazy. I wouldn't expect the Koreans of all people to have a colonial empire, especially considering that the Japanese don't. Like, they just don't. Probably because of their isolation. Maybe that's why. So as you can see, that was the first one, and now we have to trace a second line. Oh, wow, the Koreans have an empire. They own Taiwan. That is crazy, I didn't even notice that. I mean, it is a different year from, you know, what we think it is, so... Well, I wonder what the year this is depicting. I mean, never... Uh, probably 1870? I think, no, probably yes, like 1840 maybe, I don't, I, don't, I don't know. We have a lot of lines going through here. It'll be harder and harder to pick these lines. Luckily, this is probably the second last episode. And it's also coming to a close since we've probably done everything, almost everything. We still have to cover these islands right here. So, here we have the Du Beonye Bio. Oh wow, I do, I'm sorry guys, I just have no idea how to pronounce this. Du Beonye Bio? I, I, don't, I don't know Korean. Koreans in the comments, if there's anyone. Leave a comment saying how you pronounce this. Anyway, it's a peaceful colony with a significant human population. Koreans have started taking a hands-on approach in developing the local infrastructure with a look perfectly designed for inhabitation by the foes following Sikh philosophy, allowing this colony to expand steadily, not that it comes with any profit. Interesting. So we might have like Sikh uh, owned island in the future. Let's finish up this episode by doing the Al Jazur Aldurniyawiya Islands. The Earthly Islands. After all the strange oddities, horrors, and alien civilization to be encountered on the second ring, when the Ottomans encountered these seemingly normal subtropical islands, whose main oddities were a new species of fruit, some new species of parrots, and large lizards related to Komodo dragons but less remarkable, these islands certainly seemed to be completely normal, eerily normal, abnormally normal. Still, or rather because of it, the Ottomans were quick in settling the islands, primarily with Arabs, who set up many cities and towns in the green fertile grounds of the islands, later followed by Venetians taking over a small island and building the port of San Mateo. When the Ottoman Empire collapsed, half of the archipelago was annexed by France, while the other half seeked protection under the Egyptians, the Mateans serving as the middleman between the two feuding factions. And still, there's something about the normality of this place that keeps the people on edge. The islanders act like they're expecting something to happen, but nothing ever does. So this is pretty funny when you think about it. After, you know, you know the second ring will have all these weird things. God's hallucination, Zerzura, Pitesha, lands of the animals that create constructs, the Leviathans in the gates. We have uh, continuously refreshing islands in the islands of the breast. We have uh, Merlin and, uh, you know, just the old uh, like uh, people of Camelot and the Avalons. We have uh, like parasites that live in coexistence with humans and that um, like possess them in Antilia. You have moving continents and thought. You have things like uh, all these different types of living beings and humanoids. Then we have humanoids without heads and all this stuff. And then we have the Al Jazeera. Aldu Nyawiya Islands, which are completely normal, and thanks to their normalness, they are absolutely crazily scary. We have Benalea, which is a French island. The new French rulers are fairly tolerant of their Turkish subjects and incite hate for their Egyptian neighbors with exaggeration of their admittedly bad treatment of their own Turkish population. Al Jazur Al Dunyawiya, Egypt. The new Egyptian and Albanian rulers are not kind to their so Turkish subjects, but simultaneously insist that they are legitimate wild successors to the Ottoman colony, one that once existed here. Finally, we have San Mateo, post Venetian. Whenever the Venetians are involved, conflict just means profit for them. Well, guys and girls, and more, we have covered almost the entirety of the land beyond the ice walls. We have just one last area remaining, the continent of Geminia. This is the last continent remaining, and once this will be done, we will have finished to learn about the land beyond the ice walls.
at least when it comes to the second rank. Let me know if you liked the series so far, and how hyped you are for the last episode. This will be it for this episode, and I hope we will see each other next time. Goodbye.